Hello and welcome to everyone. Last week, our attempt to resurrect Confucius entailed the tale of his birth, opening up chapter 47 of the CG, which translates into English under the title Historical Records, also translated by Edouard Chavan. This chapter, you may recall, was entitled Konje Sijia, which is what you find at the bottom of this slide, meaning that this chapter is in the section on the hereditary houses. I'm referring to the hereditary house of Master Kong, and not as one might expect in the section devoted to the Li Juan, which is the word you have just beside it at the bottom of the list, which refers to biographies of individual characters. In this chapter, we find the first continuous tale of the life of Confucius forming the basis for a sort of Vulgate that has since then been transmitted throughout the centuries. This tale, as we have seen, instead of being a biography, looks much more like a hagiography in the theological vocabulary that we are most familiar with that refers to the life of a saint. And the tale begins with the birth, which is truly extraordinary since we have seen that we have the Yehe, an illicit or wild union, or if you use ye in the sense of being a wild place, non-civilized, non-domesticated, it could be outside of uh, an inhabited location, a city. We saw that the canonical exegesis gives it a meaning that is far less improper or shocking by supposing that this wild or illicit union is that of an, a father is already of a certain age with a very young girl who was barely pubescent. It is from this wild, illicit union and after prayers to Mount Ni, which you find on this second to last line on this slide, that young Confucius was born. At birth, he bore physical signs, a protuberance on his skull, and that gave him his personal name, Cho, which you have here, his Ming, meaning his personal name, and his name, meaning Chung Yi, from the name of this hill. These physical signs truly mark him as a supra human or a superman, as you would say in English, a bit like the wise mythical kings who were the heroic civilizers of ancient China, such as Fu Shi, who is supposed to have taught the human beings the art of domesticating their environment. He was also 
the person who was supposed to have passed on to human beings writing and more particularly he said to be behind the invention of what you can see here on this illustration illustration which you find in a volume written in French dating back to this famous period of the Jesuits in the 17th and 18th century. On the illustration, you can see a sort of table with what is known as the trigrams, the eight trigrams, the basic trigrams of the Book of Changes, the Li Qing in Chinese. Let me point out that our seminar to be held this afternoon at Cardinal Lumoine at 52 of Rue Cardinal Lumoine, our seminar to be held from 3 to 6 p.m. this afternoon, will be devoted to a study of this book of changes. You can see, therefore, Fuxi, where you will note the protuberances, two protuberances, just like Shennong, the divine farmer who taught human beings the art of tilling the land. And we saw his portrait the last time. And he also bears these marks. To my great surprise, I found this on the walls of Paris. But in fact, these are the ears of a cat. I don't know if there is a, a pun on, on words between Mao and Mao, uh, meaning a cat in Chinese. Mao being the in, way in French we say to mew. Some go even further in terms of the marvelous birth of Confucius by attributing the, the birth of Master Kong to that of the wise mythical kings who were supposed to be born of a young virgin who was Khan, the second word on this slide. In other words, moved in the first sense of put into movement. A young virgin who was moved by a celestial god who came down to earth in different forms, but in most cases in the form of a black bird. It may be a crow, raven, or a swallow, well, a black bird anyway. As we noted the last time, from there to drawing a possible parallel with the Immaculate Conception of Jesus, there's only one step further to go. So here we have a tale that's not something we find only in China, but also in other civilizations. You should also note that this notion of Khan, this notion, the story of young virgins who were moved by a god who came down from the skies echoes the story of the Yehe, which I recalled earlier, this sort of wild, illicit union, a union outside of human norms. This notion of can was something that we found under the Han, where it is truly central, very often associated with, let me find it, with the word Yi. So you have this notion of Kan Ying, which is truly central in the Han cosmology. And it refers to a correspondence 
or putting into phase or a resonance through can precisely by putting into movement or mutual mutually putting into movement so you have this notion of correspondence putting into resonance and to quote Baudelaire the poet is such that fragrances colors and sound echo each other so this is a phenomenon that we will certainly have an opportunity to come back to but in fact it weaves a network of correspondences or a resonance giving a sort of internal meaning to the cosmos and this is why I spoke about cosmology but it also within the human realm as well as between the cosmic natural world and the human world this is how under the Han systematically a correspondence is established a match is established between the five elements the five phases such as the earth wind water and so on which series of colors fragrances musical tones and so on and so forth nevertheless straight away in the title of this chapter 47 hereditary house of master Kong and as of the beginning of this tale of his birth chapter 47 places master Kong not only in a lineage a royal lineage but also as following in the footsteps of the wise men who civilized in ancient China and as a matter of fact it is under the Han that we saw the development and the mainstreaming of the image of Master Kong as a Su Wang which is the compound uh, word you find third on this slide I'm af afraid of moving this arrow it's hard to find afterwards so Su Wang and literally that refers to a king without a kingdom in other words a king deprived of the customary attributes of royalty we could imagine maybe a scepter or a crown but in ancient China it could be a piece of jade or something of that order in other words as we would say today a normal king so if you were to take <laughs> yes I know that expression normal is very much talked about in the press in France and I'm thinking of it because the president of the Republic who said you would be a normal president was here at this very seat a few days ago to speak to us at the Collège de France so from an etymological etymological standpoint if you were to take this word so the first word in this compound noun you will find oh gee you will find that to the towards the bottom of the character you have the radical for silk so precisely refers to silk which was not uh, well it's a bit like like unbleached linen silk that was not processed died so Su Wang is basically a king who does not wear uh, dyed processed silk and who is deprived of all the external signs of the prestige of 
the kingdom. We find so in compound nouns in modern Chinese. For example, po so, po meaning unprocessed wood, and the other word meaning someone who is simple and uh, a simple man without any special attributes. So Su Wang means a king who is such that you can't see from outside that he is a king. Now, this idea of Confucius as, so to speak, an internal king, let's say a potential or virtual king, was developed not in the Analects, the Lu Yu, where we find this term nowhere, but in another textual source, canonized as of the Han period, in other words, as of the second and first century before the Christian era. Let me remind you of the fact that this is not the case of the Lu Yu, which was canonized at a late period. This other textual source is the Chung Chu, fourth on this list. In other words, the records of spring and autumn, the annals of spring and autumn, Chun Chu, meaning spring and autumn, refers to the year in its entirety. There are two seasons forming a whole, the year. So these are annals, therefore for the place where Confucius was born, the land of Lo. Let me remind you that the character comes fifth on this slide. And these annals cover the period when 12 princes reigned in the land of Lo. And this period is precisely the spring and autumn period, historically 722 to 481 before the Christian era. Because we're talking about annals for the land where Confucius was born, and because they cover a period when he lived let me remind you of the dates traditionally uh, attributed to Confucius, 551 to 479 before the Christian era. So because of these two facts, tradition has attributed the drafting of these annals to Confucius. But subsequent scholars have concluded that it is highly unlikely that the compilation of these annals may be attributed to Confucius himself. And this is one of the main traditions in commentaries, critical interpretations of the spring and autumn annals, the Chun Chu. So one of the main critical interpretation traditions under the Han, referred to as the Kong Yang tradition, which is the second to last word on this slide. So the Kong Yang tradition develops the idea wherein Master Kong is said to have written the Chun Chu, the annals, in a sort of cryptid language. If you take these annals, you would have something that's quite comprehensible, understandable, even though, in general, it is extremely succinct in its formulation. 
but first of all, you have a time reference. You have first the name of the Prince of Lu in question. For example, let me take a typical entry in these annals. First, you have the name of the prince. Let's say a prince or called a duke, as a matter of fact. And then you would have the years of his reign, the second year or the fifth year of reign. And then you would have the season in general, which may be winter, spring, summer, autumn. And then you may sometimes have a reference to the day and sometimes even the moment in of the day. In other words, a time reference that is extremely precise. I believe I've already pointed this out. The Chinese are really obsessed with time, with historical references, time references. After all of these time references, you find uh, comments on an event. For example, the Duke of Lu met this other sovereign from a neighboring country to enter into an agreement, or this or that sovereign went hunting. And quite often, they, it's expressed very succinctly, concisely, in three words, or sometimes one word. For example, after all the time references that I just mentioned, you may find one word, for example, uh, the attack of locusts in one word, or this natural disaster occurred, and so on. So these annotations, according to this tradition of comments in the so-called Kongyang, form, in fact, a cryptid language. For example, the choice of this word rather than another, or the presence or absence of a certain expression that you would have expected at one point or another, all of this is supposed to have a meaning, something that is replete with meaning, in particular, a moral or a political meaning. This cryptid language is supposed to have been used by Confucius to express value judgments on the acts and gestures and the moral character of the princes of the day, in particular the leaders of the land of law. And in so doing, the scripted language is supposed to serve as a lesson for future sovereigns. This is implied because the Kongyang dates back to the beginning, beginning of the Han, implying, therefore, that these are cryptid lessons for emperors in the reigning dynasty, the Han. To give you an example, the very last entry in the Chunchu, the spring and autumn annals, this back to the 14th year in the reign of Duke Aidolo, meaning 481 before the Christian era. So this is really towards the very end of the annals. So what does this entry tell us? As you can see, it holds in uh, five characters which you have at the bottom of your slide. Chan, this is the time reference. 
before you had the name of the duke in question. So Duke I in, in the 14th year and in spring. And then the facts that are reported are in four characters. She, Shu Ho Lin, meaning towards the west during a hunt, a show, was captured Ho A Lin. Here we have this very complex character here. But the radical or the key you have towards the left of the character indicates that it is a stag. So it is a sort of stag or deer. But in fact, it's a fantastic animal, phantasmog phantasmagorical animal that you view as bearing a single horn. So we come back to the protuberance. The last time um, we spoke of Moses, Moses' horn. So here we have an animal with a single protuberance on his forehead. And this is why in the conventional translations in European languages, the word lin was translated as a unicorn in English. So this very brief annotation calls for a long comment in the Kongyang. In all uh, critical interpretations of the Han, it is the only tradition where in this fact, the fact of capturing a lin towards the west while hunting, the Gongyang is the only one to see in this event the prophecy of the death of Confucius. What's quite interesting is that the comments in the Gongyang, I'm not giving you the entire comments here, but it will be too long, but the Gongyang stages Master Kong, Confucius himself, and makes him speak in the first person and in direct speech. And we can see Confucius bemoaning the fact that his Tao, his way, has come to its end, has come to its end, therefore. And he sees himself almost like a prophet. He sees himself coming to his own death. And the traditional dates for Confucius make him die two years later on in 479. Now the Gongyang stage is Confucius, therefore, and they make him speak in the first person in direct speech. And this is a procedure that we find in the Liu, in the Analex. This is just something I would like to note in passing and that you should bear in mind. By the way, the comment, the Gong Yang, which I know quite a bit because I've really had to sweat blood, sweat, and tears during my PhD thesis to study it, which gave this study on the Han Confucianism, which was basically the publication of my PhD thesis in 1985, quite some time ago. So this commentary, Kong Yang, forms a sort of political treaty to be used by the Han emperors. And I apologize for this uh, strong parallel, which may I may be pushing, but it may be comparable to the production of modern think tanks for uh, those who govern us. And it is quite interesting to note that this commentary, Kong Yang, reappeared in modern China, first of all in the 19th century, more particularly at the end of the 19th century, 
as a part of a, an intention to carry out political reforms. It was very much used by scholars who embarked upon the first attempt in the entire history of China to reform political institutions in 1898. There was an aborted attempt, but it was the first step towards modernizing Chinese political institutions. And this commentary, Kong Yang, once again appears again today among certain Chinese intellectuals today who see in it a source of inspiration to, th to reflect upon political problems facing modern China. So it's not that I'm trying to uh, advocate the cause of my thesis. Even a member of the jury at the time asked me, why do you so much want to study such a boring topic? It's true that when you read this text, I can't say that it was truly, you know, very exciting at first sight. You have a commentary on the annals that is are so arid and the commentary itself is quite fastidious taking word by word the text of the spring and autumn annals wondering at great length why why uh, did confucius choose this word instead of another and so on and then you'd have uh, endless explanations. So I don't know if it is out of masochism that I chose this uh, topic for my PhD thesis, but now I can see that it was a little bit useful. Through the fantastic story on the birth of Master Kong in this chapter 47 of the historical records and in the equally fantastic tale with the prophecy of his death in the Kongyang, and here I'm speaking about two textual sources, which both date back to the beginning of the Han. So we see the beginning of the appearance of an almost deified Confucius. I spoke about saint. I even used the word a prophet. So we have almost a deified Confucius, but we emphasize this point, deified in a very political context. According to chapter 47 of the historical records, after the death of Master Kong, there was a continuous transmission that was flawless, a sort of flo transmission of flawless continuity of the how he was worshipped locally at his place of origin in the land of Lo, and then throughout the empire with the advent of the Han. Now, the excerpt, which I won't read in its entirety, because for those of you who don't understand Chinese, it may be a bit fastidious, but I will read its translation. So you find this excerpt towards the end of chapter 47. Now, this excerpt tells us that the princes of Lo which is the title Duke in our hierarchical system, is transmitted from one generation to another with the custom of offering sacrifices to Master Kong at set periods of the year. In this sentence, what I find interesting is this expression you find at the top of the slide, Lo, 
是是上传 ，meaning law, meaning the land of law or the princes of law. 是是 meaning from one generation to the following generation. You have a rep repetition here, and then you have the word 是 which you find also in the title of chapter forty-seven. The Kongzi Si Jia, meaning the house that is transmitted from generation to generation, the hereditary house of Master Kong. So the princes of law transmitted from generation to generation. The Shan Chuan is the verb that comes at the end. Literally, it means the Chuan they can transmit. Xiang. Meaning mutually. So here, we find an expression evoking a continuous transmission, and we find this problem of continuity, which we dealt with last year in our lectures. Today. With the massive return of Confucius, that can be noted in the People's Republic of China and mainland China, we have this obsession with continuity. Obviously, this continuity is reconstructed or reinvented subsequently at a later date. The idea, for example, if you were to go to Chufu. The place where Confucius was born, you are supposed to meet the direct descendants of Confucius. I must say, with all due respect for them, that I have doubts about any such continuity, since at the start of the Han, why do they insist so heavily on this continuity? Is because, in actual fact, it was extremely problematic. I always say that when an official message strongly emphasizes a theme or a slogan, a historian must always be distrustful. If they emphasize a point so much, it's precisely because it's a construction and it's something that does not exist. So here, what's quite interesting to note. Is that under the Han at the start of the Han period, they strongly emphasized this continuity because probably it was problematic. So we may say that to begin with, under the Han, the genealogy or the direct descendants of Confucius already posed a problem. So the princes of Lo, as opposed to have transmitted from generation to generation, this custom of offering sacrifices to Master Kong. Furthermore, and let me continue the translation of this excerpt. The scholars, as well, known as Lo, this is how Confucians are referred to today. The scholars too also practice rituals. Such as district banquets and、uh, archery close to the tomb of Master Kong. So ritual practices, banquets, where the elders will come together, and also archery tournaments that have nothing at all to do with Olympic tournaments. Now, these are、uh, ritual practices of archery. And all of this was supposed to be practiced in continuity, close to the tomb, or by the tomb of Confucius. They say that the tomb measures a ching, probably meaning、uh, of a considerable size, and the room where the disciples of Confucius stayed before was transformed into a funeral temple by the following generations. Who laid there the personal items that were said to have belonged to Master Kong himself, meaning his clothes, his headdress, his ceremonial headdress, his lute, 
meaning his chin. We saw in the previous lecture that Confucius was known for being a great music lover, but in a ritual context as well. Also his uh, chariot and his writings. So here we can see that Confucius was a fully accomplished man who knew how to uh, ride a chariot as well as to take part in rituals and play music. So his writings, now of course, all the commentators today would give their shirt to know what this is all about, but that's not specified anywhere. So all of these personal items were kept without interruption for over 200 years until the advent of the Han. So here you have another expression uh, emphasizing once again the theme of continuity, which you find on the second line on the slide, Xu Yu Han. Meaning, Chu Yu Han, meaning until the Han. Apayunen, in other words, during 200 years and a bit more. Puchu, meaning there was no Chu. How would I say this? no solution for continuity. In other words, no breach of continuity. In other words, without interruption. So in just a few phrases, on two occasions, we have expressions emphasizing strongly this continuity between the death of Confucius at the end of the 5th century, well, at the beginning of the 5th century, more accurately, and the Han, whose advent dates back to 206 before the Christian era. And then the passage continues and tells us that when the emperor, the founding emperor of the Han dynasty, Han Gaozu, Emperor Gao, who reigned from 206 to 195 before the Christian era, when Emperor Gao, the founder of the Han dynasty, moved on to the land of Lo, he offered a sacrifice referred to as Tai Lao, Tai Lao, which you have there fourth on the slide. So this is a great official sacrifice that is still practiced in the imperial court, known as the great sacrifice, because they would offer three victims, if you wish, I mean, big pieces, not small bits like chicken or the like, but big pieces, large animals, for example, uh, bull, a sheep, and a pig. In this respect, let me open parentheses, but I think it's quite interesting to note. Our colleague at the Collège de France, who specializes in ancient Rome, and more particularly Roman religion, Professor John Scheid, was invited by another colleague, director of studies at the Practical School of Higher Studies, Mark Kalinowski, with whom I jointly direct the collection of Chinese uh, books at the Belles Lettres, so invited, therefore, to Beijing. He th thought he was going to faint when he saw 
in a temple in Beijing the reproduction of a sort of reconstitution, let's say, of this Tai Lao, this great sacrifice, with three big chunks, so to speak. Because, of course, it reminded him this. It reminded him of the sacrifice known in ancient Rome as the Suove Torilia. The Suove Torilia, here you have a bas relief that you can find at the Louvre Museum. It's a sacrifice in the official Roman religion where, as you can see on this illustration, we have the sacrifice of the Taurus in the Suave Torilia is a mix of Taurus, Ovis, Ovis meaning a sheep, and Sus meaning a pig. So our colleague, he almost fainted. He was so surprised because it reminded him of something extremely familiar. And I believe that on several occasions I've said this here, the parallel between ancient China and uh, ancient Rome seems, how would I put this, to be more relevant than the eternal parallel that they seek to draw between China and Greece. I think on both sides, between the Pax Simica and Pax Romana, more or less occurring at the same time at the two extremities of the Euro-Asian continent at the turn of the Christian era, I believe that there are possible parallels. As regards questions on empires in construction. So let me come back to our text. So the excerpt you find at the ed end of chapter 7, when Emperor Gao Tzu moved to the land of Lu, he offered the sacrifice, the Tai Lao, at the tomb of Master Kong. And when the lords, the high dignitaries and the advisors under the Han Dynasty, that is, arrive in the land of Lo, they always begin by paying a visit to the tomb of Master Kong before moving on to taking care of their governmental business. In other words, this worship on the tomb of Confucius they're trying to tell us that this is something that has been practiced continuously since the death of Confucius up to the Han for several centuries, therefore. And it has become a mandatory, a compulsory practice, not only for the emperor, but also for all his representatives in the imperial bureaucracy, meaning the high dignitaries and ministers. We will conclude today with the epilogue given by Sima Qian, the author of the historical records, the epilogue, therefore, to chapter 47. At the start of this epilogue, there is a, a statement I like a lot because it seems to me to be saying a lot about a historian's trade. You find this expression here at the beginning, beginning of the second section, and it tells us the following. Yu Tu, Kong Shi Shu, Shang Qian, Shi Wei Yan. Meaning, therefore, you the historian is speaking in the first person, you meaning I, me, 
two, I've read the Kong Shu Shu, meaning the writings of Lord Kong. He doesn't call him master here. He calls him Kong Shu, meaning Mr. I mean, in the sense of my Lord. Lord Kong, here too as before, the commentators and historians would give everything they have to know what they're referring to here. But here, he doesn't, the author doesn't specify exactly what he's talking about, which is quite unfortunate for us. The second part of the phrase tells us tells us, therefore, that I have thought a lot. I had the intention of chen, in other words, seeing, which you find in this character, which refers to the eye. I wanted to see with my own eyes. What chi wian, in other words, what manner of man he was. In other words, I read the writings of Lord Kong, and I wanted to see what man he was. And the next phrase tells us that I went to the land of Lo. I made a trip all the way up to Lo. I contemplated the room of the funeral chamber in, of Zheng Li by calling him by his name, Zhe, but he's referring to Confucius still. I saw his chariot, his clothes, his ritual utensils, what he used for rituals, and I saw all the masters which in those times carried out rituals in his home, and I returned full of respect, and I lingered without being able to move away. So the historian in the epilogue speaks about this chapter dedicated to uh, Confucius, speaking about his emotions, a real-life experience. And this is what makes me understand this first phrase of the epilogue in this way. I've read the writings of Master Kong, of Lord Kong, rather, and I wanted to see what manner of man he was. And this is why I do not agree at all with Chavan's translation, which translates as follows. For me, when I read the writings of Master Kong, I thought I saw what man he was. In other words, Chavan understands that it is through the writings of Master Kong that he thought he saw what manner of man he was. But then afterwards you wonder why Sima Qian continues by saying, I went myself, myself to the place where he was born, to Lo, to see all of this, all of these personal belongings. So here we have the tale of a a real-life experience, and in a way, what Sima Qian, the first Chinese historian, one could say, describes, is what we suggest we should do this year. In other words, we have read the writings attributed or associated with or attributed to Master Kong, and we would like to see with our own eyes what manner of man he was. So for Sima Qian, over 2,000 years ago, it was all about res resurrecting Confucius, imagining him alive, except that the difference between us and Sima Qian is that Sima Qian was able to go to the land of Lu, and he says that he saw the personal belongings of Confucius. 
here I believe that we can uh, go to Chufu, and I think that what they would show us w would only be reconstitutions. So in a way, the resurrected Confucius that some would like to present to us is in actual fact a reinvented Confucius. I'm forced to stop here for today, but we will continue and conclude next week because it will be our last lecture together for this year on the resurrection of Confucius. Thank you for your attention. And let me remind you that you are supposed to celebrate the start of the year of the snake this weekend. So happy new year to everyone. Thank you.